grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I realize we all speak English in many accents here, so I hope you can understand mine. <laughs> and thank you very much to Pastor Willis for extending the invitation to preach this morning. It's an honor to be here with you. Um, and I brought some friends along. Well, I guess we're all friends now, aren't we, in the Lord? Um, so from coming from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America uh, this week are uh, Bishop Donald Chris from Detroit, Pastor Elizabeth Eckdale from San Francisco, Bishop Emeritus Donald McCoy from Chicago, Pastor William Flippin from Atlanta, Father Conrad Selnick from Chicago, uh, there we are, Ka uh, Ms. Catherine Laurie uh, from Chicago, and Bishop Patricia Lull from St. Paul. So did I get us all? You're good, yay. That's, we're very happy to be here. We're learning more and more about um, Geneva, um, as well as about the Lutheran World Federation and the World Council of Churches, which is important. Um, we've discovered your wind here. <laughs> uh, you are very hearty people. Um, we had a wonderful experience um, with um, fondue in a, in a restaurant in the middle of the lake with crashing ice-coated, uh, it was an interesting <laughs> night. Um, but it was, it was really wonderful. And then hearing about the history of this congregation and this church, um, I didn't know that we were in here um, in this room for fear of the Calvinists. Um, <laughs> but uh, hopefully, um, like, the, like the disciples who were locked in a room after the resurrection, once the risen Christ stood among them, you probably also are able to march out um, and, and spread the good news and talk about our new life in Christ. I also bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And we're deeply grateful for the work that you do in your various institutions, agencies um, over here in Geneva, and for your witness here um, to the gospel in this congregation. Well, we have um, just almost the end of the first chapter of the gospel according to Mark, which we have been reading since the beginning of Epiphany. And in just the first chapter, we have Jesus being baptized and um, driven into the wilderness, his testing. Um, he comes back, he's, he engages in healing, he preaches, he calls his disciples, um, he uh, makes sure that he's um, engaged in preaching roundabouts. And here in the first chapter, he's just about done everything you expect someone to do who's going to be a Messiah. So next week is um, the Transfiguration, and Pastor Willis can tackle that. Um, sometimes difficult um, <laughs> holiday. Um, but in this last part here, as we're summing up um, the revelation of God's work in Jesus Christ, the revelation of the, uh, how God has chosen to demonstrate the inbreaking of God's kingdom, we have a bunch of stories all clumped into one. Jesus had gone to synagogue. Now, I used to use this in the parish to chide people who said they really did not need to t attend worship services on a regular basis. And I said, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> so he comes from the synagogue. They immediately go um, to uh, Peter's house. Um, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law, who gets up immediately, as Mark says, and serves, um, serves uh, the, 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 the guests. Um, people start to bring their sick. Jesus heals them. Um, he takes time off, as he often did, something that's also, I think, instructive, at least to this extremely busy, distracted, sort of Martha person, that Jesus took time to go by himself to a lonely place in order to pray. And that also, if that's good enough for Jesus, it ought to be good enough for me. And then his disciples hunt for him. I, that word that we have um, in a lot of other translations that said they, they were looking for him. But they hunt for Jesus. And finding them, they say, people are looking for you. You need to be busy. He has to heal more people, cleanses a demoniac of a demon, and then says, I need to go out and preach. This is what I need to do. This is a, a lot packed in. I saw in one commentary, they just called this a day in Capernaum. As it's like a regular day in the life of Jesus and all of Jesus' uh, servants. But it brings up some really important, for at least for me, important things to pay attention to, not only what God is about, but some things that we're about that might not be consistent or helpful 
as we strive to be those who answer the call that Jesus has given to us. Of course, I think we understand the yearning that people have when they keep bringing their sick to Jesus, that he might just touch them and heal them. A yearning that we would all understand. If it's a, a, a possession by a demon or a physical ailment, we heard about the demon-possessed person last week in the synagogue and again in this chapter, in this passage, or even Peter's mother who has something as normal as a physical ailment as a fever, we all long to be healed. We all long to be made whole. And so they keep bringing their sick to Jesus to be made whole. This, this human yearning for this. And they see in Jesus something, something that's happening. And it's very interesting in Mark how people address Jesus, particularly those people who are on the margins, including the demons. Over and over again, or at least three times, we'll take three times in Mark, we hear these demons addressing Jesus with an incredibly high Christology, son of the Most High, son of, the, son of David, son of the, the Holy One of Israel, save me, leave me alone, we know who you are. And it's interesting that those who should know who Jesus is, either the allies, his disciples, or his adversaries, the Pharisees and others and the religious establishment have a very low Christology. So here we have them calling Jesus teacher or master. Those on the margins recognize the Christ. Those who are on the inside for some reason, maybe familiarity, only talk about Jesus as teacher or master. And since most sermons that I preach are preached to myself, I will not indict you unless it seems to fit, then go right ahead. I'm wondering if my Christology has become so low because of my own familiarity with the Jesus story. And I'm wondering also if this, quote, messianic secret that we hear about in Mark all the time, Jesus saying, don't speak about me, if this messianic secret might actually be something that I, with a lower Christology, my familiarity with Jesus, actually perpetrate. Have I domesticated Jesus? Have I enlisted Jesus in my own cause, or my own manifesto, or my own priorities? And so the secret is not that Jesus denies that he's the Christ, but the secret is that Jesus says, you have got the wrong idea about what God is doing in me and who has come near. It is not just that Jesus is a great teacher or a great master in the sense of, of some sort of uh, someone in an ashram or, or someone seeing Jesus as Che Guevara or the family values guy who holds up traditional values, however we want to do domesticate Jesus. And I think that's why we can't always see Jesus. The secret is caused because we have not been able to expand our understanding and our, our vision of what Jesus is about. When Jesus engages in healing, in preaching, in teaching, in the miracles, it's not somehow um, as, as just a miracle worker, but we know that all of those things are signs that point to Jesus so that we don't believe in the signs, but we believe in the one to whom the signs point. That's what was going on. But very often, in my earnestness, I think what Jesus is trying to help us do is to take up a particular cause. Some people might call it the Markan Manifesto, this first chapter. And if we somehow become engaged in radical discipleship, if we somehow get busy, we can bring about the kingdom of heaven. We are the ones, then, who are tasked with bringing justice and healing and wholeness to this world. That's all our work, and it becomes all about us. Now think about how tiring and futile that would be. I am amazed at this city, a city of peace, of the Lutheran World Federation, the World Council of Churches, the United Nations, UNICEF, Red Cross, Red Crescent, the International Labor Organization, just to name a few. A whole city devoted to bringing justice and peace to a world. This is even the place where the Geneva Conventions were brought about so that the horror of war might become just a little less horrible. But what motivates, or maybe what 
makes it possible for you to sustain that kind of work in this city on behalf of the rest of the world? What makes it possible for you to come from so far away, most of us, from other places, and not grow weary or lonely in this work? If it's all or only about us, it is going to be a frustrating and I think unsatisfying exercise, doomed to failure. There is no way that we can bring about this new kingdom. There's no way that we can bring about the, 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 the wholeness that God intended for all of creation. And the harder we try, I think the worse it gets if we depend upon our own agency. I mean, I can just hear Paul in that passage from the seventh chapter of Romans saying, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I wonder if sometimes you, in the noble work you do in this city on behalf of the rest of the world, come to that point wondering, who will deliver us all from this body of death? The truth is that all of the people Jesus healed in this, in, in, in up to this point in Mark and in all of his ministry, all of the people even he raised from the dead, Lazarus, the, the son of the widow of Nain, the daughter of the president of the, of the synagogue, um, it, it, all of those people, they would all die. This was not a permanent solution and that is not the point of the miracles. I remember when this was really brought home to me that, that life is a fragile thing and on our own and by our own effort or understanding, quoting Luther, we can't make it right, we can't get it right. And if this is all there is, only what we are able to accomplish by our own effort or will, then I'd give up now. Bishop Law and I were sitting in a, 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 a seminar with Walter Bowman, an, an American theologian and professor at one of our seminaries, and we were going through systematic theology, and we volunteered for this. Do you remember that seminar years ago? And our, our, uh, my husband's and my little daughter Rebecca, was our first daughter, was just still a little baby. And I was just so, you know, I love this little baby and this is a sign of life. And I kept talking about this as a sign of life. And he said, no, all you have done is prepared her for death because that is the course of human life. Yeah, that's exactly the look I had on my face. In fact, I think I started to cry at that point. <laughs> and if that is all it is, if, if it's only up to us, that is in fact true. But the healing that Jesus does, the calling of disciples that Jesus engages in, all of the work of Jesus is not somehow to bring about a new political reality. In fact, any time that we as the church think that we can bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth, it's just doomed to be one political system replacing another. And no matter how noble and good our intentions might be, because the brokenness and sin lives within us, even the best systems are doomed to fail if they're only our systems. Well, mercifully, um, Bishop Lull was in that class, and she pointed out to Dr. Bowman that that's not the entire story. That what is, Jesus is demonstrating here and, and the hope that we have is that it was not human effort, it's not our work, but God's work. And this work is a work that didn't come about to change behaviors or political systems or institutions. It's the work of God in Christ that fundamentally and irrevocably changes us and all of creation. The work of, of God in Jesus Christ through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is to put an end to sin and death and all that separates us from God and therefore from one another. That is the permanent work and that is the good news. And only because of that, I think, is it possible for us then to participate in this work that God has begun in Jesus Christ. Bishop Law quickly stepped in and said, but wait, Dr. Bowman, she has not just condemned this child to death since she's baptized, but she has fit her for heaven to live with you there. I think I finally stopped crying when you said that in class. 
Jesus has come to bring about a much more permanent ontological, eschatological solution. It is the defeat of sin and death. And so this is not about us, thank God. It is about the work that God has done in Jesus, and God invites us to participate in that. If we look at the Gospel of Mark and our efforts as somehow this manifesto for us to bring about the new kingdom, our discipleship is really turned around. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who we found, spent time at the World Council of Churches in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, wrote, Discipleship is not an offer one makes to Christ. It's Christ who does the inviting, Christ who makes it possible for us to work and to serve, Christ who makes it possible for us to speak a word of good news, even in the unbelievable horror that we see all around us, the horror of the largest refugee population in the history of the world, the horror of, thing, of burning people alive in metal cages, the horror of, of racism in our own country, all of those things, that has been defeated in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And because it has been defeated, even and especially in the face of that, we, like Jesus, are called to go and preach that word. And hearing Paul and quoting the hymn, how can we keep from preaching? How can we keep from singing? Let the good news out. Let's not be stuck in a room for fear of the Calvinists who are preaching the good news someplace else, I'm sure, but trusting even and especially in the most deadly places that that death has been defeated, we can be signs of new life. Amen. Amen. too dizzy. <laughs> we will now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed.